OSPF is a link state routing protocol and it sends triggered and periodic updates about the network and uses what's known as the shortest path first algorithm in order to build and calculate the shortest path to all known destinations. So these all known destinations are the IP subnets behind all of the routers in an OSPF area. And OSPF routers do this by sending an update about the network when there has been a change, but they also send a link refresh update, which sends its entire routing table once every 30 minutes, even if no network changes have occurred. And this is to ensure all routers have the same information. All routers are in sync with each other. And all of the routers participating in OSPF go through three main steps. And from the steps, they build three tables. So in the first step, the OSPF routers discover neighbors they can form relationships with. And they put this information in what's known as the neighbor table. So these six routers here would find out about each other and store the information about each of his connected neighbors in the neighbor table. And then for the second step, they build what's known as the topology table. And this is like a map of the whole area. So the routers know about all of the different pathways to every single network. And this is what the topology table is. All the routers have the same map, which is a map of every router within the area and all of the networks behind the routers. This router here, R1, has many paths to R2 here. It can go this way or this way, or it can even go this way and so on. So there's many paths between R1 and R2, and this would all be held in the topology table. So the topology table has all of the different routes to networks within an area. And all routers in an area will have the same topology table, but based on where they are, they will have different routing tables. And that's the final step, the third step. And with the final step, the routers build a routing table, and this is the best path to get to all of the networks. So for example, R1 has lots of pathways to get to the network behind R2, which is held in the topology table, but the best path would be imported into the routing table. And this will be the path used to get to that network. And with R1's best path to R2 using OSPF, is not necessarily based on the least amount of hops like the RIP routing protocol, but it's based on the fastest link. So R2 to R1 link might be a slow 100 meg connection, but if it went via R5, for example, these links might be 10 gig links, meaning they are much quicker links, and this is put into the routing table and used to reach the network behind R2 from R1. So it's based on the bandwidth speeds rather than the number of hops it takes. And what these routers do, they exchange information by flooding link state updates, which is flooded to all routers in the area advertising their links, known as link state advertisements via these updates. And this is stored within the router's link state databases, and the database is used to build the topology map. And this happens every time a change occurs, such as a network that goes down, or a new network added to one of the routers, or once in a while to make sure everyone is in sync as well. And every single router needs to have this same topology database within an OSPF area. So that's a lot of information each router has to hold, and each router has to advertise about its links to every other router. Here R1 needs to send advertisements about its links and all of the other routers have to do the same. And the bigger the area, meaning the more routers in the area, the more OSPF traffic is exchanged in the area with exchanges of these link state advertisements and the bigger their link state databases become and all of their other tables as well. And this can lead to performance issues with OSPF. So the more routers, the more changes that are going to occur within the area because the networks are going up and down. There will be more OSPF traffic and more exchanges of information between the OSPF routers and the need for all of the routers to rebuild their tables again. And this is why having more than one area is needed. This is why we need to split off the routers into multiple areas. And the benefit to this is that all flooding of advertisements and the topology databases each router builds is all limited within the area. Areas act as the boundary on the link state updates that the routers are exchanging. So now if we look at these six routers that will have a topology database each, and if we wanted to add another few routers, this will impact the topology databases of the current routers and the databases will grow. But if we put the routers in their own area, the topology databases wouldn't be impacted on the six routers in the current area. The new routers will build their own databases within the new area without impacting the current area. So this is the advantage of multiple areas. And there are some rules with areas. You start with area zero, which is known as the backbone area, and then any other area would connect into the backbone area. So other areas such as area one and two cannot directly connect to each other. This would break one of the rules. They need to connect to the backbone area directly and route traffic through the backbone area to reach each other. 
and the reason all areas connect back into the backbone area is to avoid rooting loops. So all areas will inject their roots into the backbone and the backbone will root out into all areas. There is an exception or a temporary way around this however, where you can use something known as a virtual link, but this is used in a situation where you cannot join an area to area zero, maybe because it's able to connect to another area. So a temporary fix, you can use a virtual link to join, let's say area 10 to area 11, whilst you redesign your areas. And the reason this occurs is maybe area 10 and area 11 are two offices next to each other, where area 0 is situated across a slow one link to another city. So this is an example in a real world environment. But what connects all of these areas together is known as an area border router. An ABR, for short, is a router that has interfaces connected into at least two different OSPF areas, including the backbone area. And they hold topology information about each of the areas they are connected to. So they have a copy of the link state databases for each area they are connected to. The ABR advertises subnets about its areas to other areas. But the magic with the ABR is that it summarizes the network. And what the ABR does, it advertises the summary network of area 0 to area 1. In other words, it's telling area 1, anything destined for the summary network, just send it to me and I will handle it. This means area 1 doesn't need to worry about the specific subnets in area 0 and where they are whether a specific subnet is on router 1 or router 3. Area 1 doesn't need to know about this. Nothing changes on Area 1. It has the summary network of all the networks in Area 0 and knows the summary network is towards the ABR and that's all it needs to know. But the ABR itself needs to know everything about both networks and that's why it has databases of all the links in both networks and is told about any topology changes. Whether the network is up or down and whether the path has changed etc. It needs to know all about these changes. So, for example, you have 10.0.0.24 on this router here, and 10.0.1.0.24 here, 10.0.2.0 here, and 10.0.3.0 here. So these are all slash 24 subnets. Now, rather than advertising all four networks to area 1, we can summarize all of the four networks with a slash 22 bit mask of 10.0.0.0 slash 22, which is 245, 255.252.0. And this will advertise the range 10.0.0.0 to 10.0.3.255 as a summary address to area 1. Now area 1 doesn't need to worry about the topology map of area 0. It doesn't need to worry that the link for 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network has gone down on router 1 or it has appeared on router 2. It just knows everything on the summary address 10 slash 22 network will go via the ABR. And this expands into the topic of a special kind of area as well known as a stub and there's also a totally stubby area and a not so stubby area which i've covered in another video and this calls out for another point on the abr ideally the abr needs to be a stable router you don't want an old sluggish router being an abr as the abr needs to know about the different areas it is attached to basically you don't want it to be a router on its last legs which is 10 years old and the cpu is maxing out just make sure the ABI is a, a nice healthy router without any performance issues. One key point about the ABI and summarizing your networks is you need to make sure you can summarize your networks. So don't mix your networks with discontinuous IP subnets from all over the place. You won't be able to summarize them and you will have issues. Best practice is to try and keep your networks together in a hierarchy so you can summarize them. And a real world example of having multiple areas is you might have an office in London that you put all of the routers within London into OSPF area zero. And then you might have offices in New York you put into area one. And this would be a good design practice because now when changes happen in London, you want those changes to stay within London. You don't want to sync these changes over the slow one link across to the New York and vice versa. So you would want London and New York to be in their own areas. Then there's another type of OSPF router known as the Autonomous System Boundary Router or router. It's called this because it's at the boundary between the autonomous system and external systems. Basically, this is for external routes such as another routing protocol like EIGRP, BGP, static routes, etc. that you want to import into OSPF. This is also known as redistributing them into OSPF. In the diagram we can see R6 is connected into a cloud environment and using static routes to reach these cloud networks here. 
if we redistribute these roots into SPF, they generate LSAs for each of these roots, known as type 5 LSAs. I've done another video on the different types of link state advertisements. Now with these routes redistributed into the OSPF system, they will be propagated through the OSPF area and every router will get to know about them. And like the ABR, the Area Border Router or Router, the ASPR, the Autonomous System Boundary Router, is able to summarize the networks as well. So rather than advertising these two separate networks as slash 24 subnets, we can advertise them as slash 23 subnets instead.